I'm going to talk about understanding behavior in Fragile X, in particular the four A's. Um, mostly everything that I have up here is in your notes, okay? Please ask questions. Raise your hand. Happy for you to pick my brain if um, you want to know any more details, okay? So more than happy for people to interrupt me. So Fragile X syndrome is at a genetic level, so it's in every cell of the individual's body from the, from the word of conception right through. It's replicated the expansion in every cell. So it, it really does make the individual susceptible to a whole range of uh, functional, developmental, physical and neurological um, issues. So these are the ones that we're kind of going to focus on today. Okay, the attention difficulties. So 80% of individuals with Fragile X will actually satisfy criteria for ADHD. Does everybody know what ADHD is? Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. So it includes impulsivity and executive functioning issues. So that's part of the neurodevelopmental issues. It's a biochemical difficulty in the brain. <coughs> and then there's the autism disorder or autism-like behaviors. So about 30% of individuals with Fragile X will also satisfy criteria for full autism, okay? A much larger proportion will also have autism-like behaviors. So you'll see things like flapping or rocking or picking or tapping or sensory stimulation behaviors that may not be the full autism, but it will actually denote a behavior that looks autism-like. Difficulty with regulation. So this is the stuff that most people will come and see me with. It's the difficulty with managing those emotions. Yeah, the anxiety, the getting overwhelmed, the fears, the difficulty with aggression maybe, okay, frustration, as well as the perception um, or the management of self-behaviors, so how they treat themselves and how they treat others. Health conditions, so eyes, ears, skin, digestion can actually be a thing also. So there can be difficulty with digestive issues in a lot of our individuals with Fragile X, um, and that can very much contribute. So in a disability population, one of the main causes of behavioral issues, do people know, all the carers out there? Whether they've got intellectual disability, autism, Fragile X, what's the one leading behavioral contributor? Constipation. Okay, so our individuals with developmental disabilities actually have gut issues. They'll have dietary issues or their gut doesn't do the things that our gut does, which is move the food through. They get constipated, they have malabsorptions, and then behavior follows. They feel awful. How do we feel if we're feeling awful? Grumpy, yeah, irritable, reactive. So it doesn't take much to then see behavior, okay? So behavior is often a communication for the person about what's happening, both their experiences, their internal states, and that external situation. So it could be an internal issue that in fact they're communicating to you through behavior or through action because they often have a communication issue. So priority one, Jonathan kind of alluded to it, you gotta know what you're dealing with, yeah? Just because they've got a diagnosis of Fragile X, do we know that they can see, that they can hear, that, that in fact they don't have some other health issue going on? Pain somewhere. How do we react if we're in pain? Oh, we're all sunny and happy? No, yeah? We're irritable individuals, so you're much more likely to have an individual who's highly reactive. So if you understand, come on, if you understand what you're dealing with, we can then make a plan on how to manage it, okay? So identify the person's strengths and weaknesses. Identify what they're good at, what they might need additional support for, when we can back away and when we need to come in and support. The diagnosis part is, yeah, we've got the fragile X, but what else is going on, okay? So the difficulty in developmental disabilities is that often people get a single diagnosis and then people stop looking, yeah? 
they'd put all of the difficulties and all of the challenges down to that one diagnosis. So if the person gets an intellectual disability diagnosis, or let's just say a young person gets a developmental delay diagnosis, and the genetics isn't done, they get an intellectual disability diagnosis, but they don't get maybe autism or fragile X or a hearing impairment or a visual impairment or a specific learning difficulty and it's just all put down to that first diagnosis. So if you're an educator, if you're a therapist, if you're a parent, even if you're a carer and we've got an adult, we can still look at this stuff to help shape the person's experiences. So I've put a little word up here which is comorbidities, okay? Areas are of a concern but also comorbidities and comorbidities are coexisting but not caused by, okay? So if you've got a broken thumb, that's going to inhibit you doing a whole bunch of things, right? But if you've got a broken toe, you've got a broken thumb and a broken toe now. The broken thumb didn't cause the broken toe, but now you're doubly disabled, aren't you? We're hobbling along, yeah? Okay, so the two things can actually have impairments. We've got to know what those comorbidities are. And the common comorbidities for Fragile X attention issues, hyperactivity, executive functioning issues, autism, okay? Yeah, I just gotta get my clicker, there we go. All right, so number two, priority number two, educate yourself. Everybody gets a big tick for that one, you're here today, yeah? So we're gonna work hard today to formulate what this is all about, as well as later on the day, we're gonna talk very much about the interventions, what we can do to improve your experiences, their experiences of life. Health issues are a big thing because often communication is um, not easy to understand if they've got a pain somewhere, feeling off somehow. And so um, knowing the individual's behavior can actually tell us if they're a little off, yeah? So somebody who's really hyperactive and loves to pace, if they stop pacing, that's an indicator in and of itself, yeah? If they're sleeping more, that's an indicator in and of itself. If they usually have a good morning ritual and they don't do it, that's an indicator, okay? So you've got to know your person, and if they're doing something different, start looking, okay? So behavior is a communication. Their emotion and their mood, their usual kind of ups and downs as well as any specific learning issues. There is definite great strengths in the cognitive profiles of some of these individuals, things they're actually really, really good at, all right? We can use that as a benefit. Motor and speech issues, we often see those, they're very easy to see, okay? Then the third priority is services for support. What does the individuals need, both within the home, school, or day center? Um, parents and carers need, so are you well supported? Have you put your hand up for respite? Have you put your hand up if you need additional support to help so that you don't get burnt out, okay? Uh, other family needs. What are the sibling needs? What do they need in a family that has additional needs within it, yeah? Do they need social opportunities if they're not affected or if all of the children or all of the siblings, even if they're adults, are affected. They still need the ability to socialize with each other. I work with adults and I ask them, have you seen your brother or sister? And they're like, no, they're in another house, half an hour, 45 minutes away. And so part of their sense of family is that we get the workers to bring them to a mutual spot on a regular basis. Is somebody coordinating this idea that they have a family who's also in a residential facility? Yeah? It's important for connectivity. And this will come out also. A lot of the indig individuals with Fragile X who don't have autism are incredibly sociable individuals. The anxiety makes it hard for them to approach new situations, but they're the ones going, you want a cup of tea? I'll make you a cup of come sit with me and chat with me. So once they know you, they are highly sociable. And that's one of the differences between Fragile X and autism, is that in fact they love that little bit of socialization, yeah? The autism in the 30% is one of those things where they're really not that interested in the social. They're very introverted, 
Okay, so there's the difference between the individuals with fragile X who has the autism in addition, as well as some of the sensory stuff, and, but a lot of the fragile X individuals love socializing, grandparents, family connection, yeah? So we need to maintain that or help them maintain it if they're unable to. There is no recipe. So if you're looking for a do number one, do number two, we're not going to be able to give that to you today beyond these concepts. Because every individual is different. Every family is different. Every community is different. But if we follow this kind of idea of do we know the person? Can we get to know what their important desires are, goals in life? What do they love? What are their interests? Some individuals absolutely love footy. Yeah? Get them down to the football weekly. Get membership. Some of them love playing lawn bowls. Some of them love discos and music and movies. We access that in order to get that sense of community. So we know the person, we understand their issues, we look at what specific needs they have, and then we look at the individual within the system. Okay? Uh, the professionals around you, if you don't know how to manage some of the behaviours or the special needs, will help you. So today we're going to go through the four A's. Arousal, anxiety, attention and autism. Okay? Behaviour is often associated with our level of arousal, our level of anxiety, as well as what we're attending to and what's executive functioning. And so we're going to talk about all of these things. Okay? So, I'm going to explain to you what arousal actually is. Actually, I'm going to get you to explain to me what arousal is. What's arousal? Don't know? Response to a stimulus. Thank you. So, every single person, whether we've got fragile X, developmental disability, anything, if you have the ability to open your eyes and perceive the world, you have an arousal mechanism. Okay? So every animal, every living entity has an arousal mechanism. It's a very old part of the brain. It goes from really deep sleep right up through that kind of, I've just woken up groggy, under aroused, to the ideal zone where we're best for learning and listening to over aroused, which is when everything feels like too much. Okay, so arousal is in the old part in this brain stem here. And we become aware of the world around us. Now, how do we respond to the world around us? We have perception. Our sensory system is the interface between us and the world around us. So we hear things. We see things, we smell things, we taste things, we feel things, yeah? Without our sensory system, the world's shut off from us. We can't perceive anything. We don't hear any of those noises to wake us up, yeah? So in fact, our perception is what's really important with regard to how up or down on that arousal mechanism we move. Now this is really, really important because when we look for managing over arousal, what do you think we're going to intervene at? Perception level. Okay? We're going to talk a lot about that later in speech and OT. Okay? For management. So if we remember, if we're in a highly noisy situation, you've gone to a massive shopping center the day before Christmas. There's people everywhere, there's piped music, people chatting, blah, 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 blah. <coughs> you and I are also going to feel what? We're going to feel like there's lots coming into our, our, our brain, right? Because there's a lot of information to process. So we can get just as overwhelmed it's just the threshold for each and every person is set at a different level as to where that sense of overwhelmedness comes in. Okay? Now, we also talk about arousal because this has like a thermostat associated with it. Now, some people find it really hard to get going in the morning. Anybody find it really hard to get going in the morning? Yeah? 
What do we need? We need a lukewarm shower or a cold shower. We need coffee. We need stimulants. We might need a run, yeah, in order to get us out of that kind of, I've just woken up, that under aroused state, okay? Other people, they wake up and bing, yeah? They are wide awake. So their arousal mechanism is more regulated to zooming past the under arousal and straight into that good mechanism of ideal zone. Yeah? Now, individuals who are particularly sensitive to perception or if they haven't got a particularly good regulator on their arousal mechanism can zoom straight past under arousal, ideal zone, and end up over aroused quite quickly and then they can look quite anxious at almost anything. So anybody know a fragile X individual who sounds a little bit like that? Yeah. It's about their regulator in the arousal mechanism gets activated quite quickly and they get over aroused very easily. So some of the management will be about managing the regulation of their arousal mechanism. And again, we're gonna cover that later just to put things into perspective of how we're picking certain interventions compared to others. So, all of us, this is the way our brain works. We have our arousal, depends on what state we're at, under, ideal, over. Then we've got our perception of what's going on around us. We interact with the world around us, as well as our internal thoughts. What happens? Emotion happens. We filter the information through our experiences, okay? So if the fire alarm went off right now, we're all pretty calm, right? Some people might freak out because if they've had a bad experience previously with a fire alarm, with that particular noise, they will have a different emotional experience. Somebody might go, oh, that's exciting. Let's go see what's happening they've had a different emotional experience to the same perception. Somebody might go, ah, it does it all the time. That's no big deal. That's a pretty neutral emotional experience, isn't it? Okay, so our emotions get filtered. Sorry, our emotions filter through our learned experiences of perception as well as colored by where we are on our arousal mechanism. Hokey dokey, so arousal, Optimal level is essential for normal functioning. In Fragile X, poor self-regulation mechanism. Yeah, our regulator is really what's having a little bit of issue. So we often use external methods to assist regulation of this mechanism. Cause, anxiety, hyperstimulation, change, waiting, fears, perceived pressure, they're all on that third step that filter mechanism, most of them. Arousal and anxiety and hyperstimulation are the second. Result, we see anxiety, aggression, crying, perseveration. Do you know what perseveration is? Perseveration is doing over and over and over, almost stuck in a loop. When are we leaving? Where are we going? <coughs> what time? When are we leaving? Where are we going? What time? When are we leaving? Where are we going? What time? And you've answered it three times now. Are you done? You're done. They're not. Okay, <laughs> does that make sense to people? All right, that's partly driven because they're hyper aroused, they're anxious, they're waiting for change, they're, they're dealing with change or they're having to wait and then they get stuck in this information deriving or a behavior can also be a perseverative behavior and perseveration just means getting stuck and doing something that's almost in a loop, okay, over and over and over again. Hand flapping, hand biting, jumping, any of that sort of behavior. The hand biting is really quite common or knuckle biting or wrist biting. Okay, under arousal, daydreaming and inattention. This is another derivative instead of the hyper aroused. It is common for some of our individuals to be quite under aroused and they, we can have difficulty getting them going, getting them off the chair, getting them engaged to come out into the community. Uh, prescription would be a sensory diet, whoop, come back, 
come back. Sensory diet or what we call sensory lifestyle, which means it's just integrated into their everyday behaviors. It's about managing the regulation, helping them to regulate that mechanism on an everyday, multiple times a day type, just weaved into their life, okay? Behavioral mechanisms and some individuals respond really quite well to medications to help with the regulation. All right, anxiety. What's anxiety? Scared, yeah. What else? Worrying. Worrying, yes. I'm sorry, speak up. Stress. Stress, yes. Anybody here never ever in their life been anxious? There, just in case people in the front don't know, nobody's raised their hands, okay? Not everybody in this room has fragile X, yeah? Anxiety is a normal human emotion. It has a really appropriate place in our human existence. Okay? So anxiety is there to do what for us? What's it do? Motivate you. I'm sorry? Motivate you. Motivate you, yeah. Can motivate you. Can make you cautious, yeah, for new things. If you're about to go into a new situation, we can feel a little bit anxious, can't we? That's perfectly normal, yeah? If you're about to stand up in front of 55 people and talk, is it pretty normal? Yeah, depends on whether you've done it lots of times or not, <laughs> yeah? It's actually pretty normal in order to prepare yourself and plan but it takes a lot of energy, okay? So it makes a lot of sense. It's a preparation for newness, a preparation for change, a preparation for unique experiences, a preparation for the unknown. And so it actually helps us to manage, put energy in where we have to facilitate new plans, new actions, new behaviors, new solutions. However, where does it become a problem? if we become too anxious or anxious all the time, yeah? Because that means that level of anxiety, energy, when you see anxiety, you should equal energy, okay? That amount of energy is actually being put out all the time. And in fact, if we are hyper aroused, and I often try and differentiate hyperarousal from anxiety. If we're hyperaroused individual or easily hyperaroused, then our brain goes looking for the things that are threats. Because this is a primitive emotion. If there was a saber-toothed tiger around the corner, I'm gonna be quite cautious and anxious so that I can prepare myself to look and then to fight or flight, run, right? But if we are looking all the time for the threats, I'm here, there's no saber-toothed tiger. So what am I actually gonna be anxious about? I'm gonna be anxious about the podium. I'm gonna be anxious about the screen. Because my brain is gonna try and find the threat and say to me, don't go near that thing. That thing is a danger. And so people can actually talk themselves into a lot of fears because their brain is looking to help them to survive. Does that make sense? Okay, so anxiety is supposed to be a helpful emotion, but when we got too much, it can make life really hard, okay? And if you're hyper aroused, your brain is looking for threats. Individuals with fragile X are often hyper aroused. So therefore, we often talk about anxiety. What is the difference between arousal and anxiety? And we just kind of covered that. So arousal is the status of the brain regarding alertness. Under aroused, ideal, over aroused, okay? And once we're getting at the top of the over aroused section, what comes? Panic, fight, flight, fear, okay? And there is some research that's starting to talk about fibbing, lying in kids as a fight or flight response. So I'll just throw that one in there because that's fairly new research. But fight or flight, freeze, okay? Some people just shut down. They don't actually run, they don't actually fight, they become nonverbal. They can't think. 
Okay? And that can happen to us, it can happen to any individual if we get overwhelmed, truly overwhelmed. Okay? Anxiety is the thoughts and feelings associated with experiences or thoughts, often an internal process and reactive. Both are possible in Fragile X. So hyperarousal and anxiety. I want you to think two different things now. Yeah? How do we differentiate to manage the situation better and help people to cope? Think about the perception load of the environment. We walk into the situation, how much noise is there? Have you stopped and thought, what is it like for this person in this environment? How many people? How much noise? If you stop and listen, you can hear the motor running. Can you hear that? So if you're listening to my voice, you've switched your attention, you've cancelled out that motor of the projector. But if I make you think about the motor of the projector, how loud is it? That's annoying, isn't it? And individuals with Fragile X have difficulty with that channel switching. They hear that and they're competing with my voice and they have to distract themselves from that humming and try and listen to my voice. Okay, and then if somebody else is chatting behind them, they now have three competing noises. And then all of a sudden there's a siren going past on the road outside. They've got four competing noises. You getting the idea? Then we've got the visual stimuli, the sensory stimuli of smell. Is it hot or cold in the place? Think about the perception load of an environment, okay? If the person's brain is full, it won't cope, okay? That is for every one of us, all right? If a situation, trigger, or specific event causes a reaction, it's likely to be due to thoughts that are unhelpful or positive functions. So again, it's about that emotional or learnt behavior, okay? If there's additional emotion for the individual, past experience of the individual, if an individual perceives themselves as not being good at something, any individual, if I put you into a position that you think you won't be able to do it, I said, here you go, finish my talk. How do you feel? <laughs> she gone, no, 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 no. You become defiant, anxious, worried, resistant, yeah? So what a person's strength and weakness profile will tell us whether they will talk to themselves about, I'm capable and competent, I can have a go. But if we put them consistently into a situation where they perceive failure, they're gonna be resistant, okay? And they'll feel anxious. All right, the behavior chain. The behavior chain is the universal understanding of behavior, basic understanding of behavior. So I say that it's a chain because the first piece of a chain of a link any bracelet, any necklace has links, doesn't it? Yeah? The first point is the antecedent, the beginning event, the noise, the request, the internal experience, the stomach ache, whatever the person is experiencing. The next link that intertwines with it is the response that you see from the person, the behavior, what's going on for that person? And then the consequence is the reaction to these two. So we have three links. Now the consequences then can become your next antecedent. So if a person does something and then you say, stop it. Hmm, now we've got the reaction to being growled at. New chain, new set of links, okay? A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. Each one continues. So if we want to change a behavior, do we react at the consequences? Where's the smartest place? The A's, that's right. It's a bit like if you want to train a horse, you got to train it before it gets out of the gate. Once the, the horse is bolted, it's too late to shut the gate. Okay? Reacting here can have an influence if the person can learn and move it back to here. But the most effective place to change behavior is, let's look at what the triggers are. Let's look at the antecedents. Let's look at what's happening for the person. 
Okie dokie, so interrupting the behavioral chain, identify the antecedents, avoid them, reduce sensory input, introduce those distractors so that they can regulate and calm themselves, use the calming techniques. Attention, if we're talking about ADHD, inattention. What does inattention look like? Blank face. Can be a blank face, can be daydreamy, yeah? Can have difficulty focusing, highly distracted, listening to the noises instead of my voice, right? There's actually a huge amount that, actually, that goes into a person's ability to focus and attend, to pick what it is they're supposed to be attending to, yeah? What does hyperactivity look like? Fidgeting. A tornado. a tornado. Yes, at the extreme, it does look like a tornado. At a milder, it looks like fidgeting, restlessness, picking, yeah? Tapping the foot, right? So there's a whole spectrum from mild to quite significant amounts of increased energy. And you know what? Language can also be hyperactivity. So a person who talks and 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 talks can be hyperactive. Yeah? Impulsivity? What is impulsivity? <coughs> Doing and not really thinking first. Okay? So most of us consider what is actually going to happen and we think about it before we do. For individuals that are impulsive, they haven't expanded that moment in time. Thought, action becomes connected. Right? So, we can have impulsive thoughts, we can have impulsive behaviours. They may not even finish listening to a sentence or an instruction, because they hear the first three words, they're done, they've made a plan, they're off. Okay? So we can have impulsive thinking, and they cognitively jump ahead, as well as behaviours. So they grab something that might be hot, because they haven't thought about it being hot, yeah? So management is often medical, OT with sensory regulation and psychology, behavioral, and environmental mechanisms. I have put the ADHD criteria in your notes. We're not going to read through all of those. You can look them up on the web or read them. Um, it requires a medical practitioner or psychologist to diagnose ADHD for um, treatment and management. So managing ADHD traits. These are just some suggestions. Avoid long periods of confinement. One of the most common confinement areas are the car. Having to sit in a car, okay? Hotel rooms are another one. A room where the person cannot move or pace. If they have a job station and they can't move, that can actually be really difficult for an individual with hyperactivity. So programs that require lots of sitting. Offer fidgeting and fiddling opportunities, okay? So I, I tell a little joke, you can always tell a hyperactive person if you take them to a Chinese restaurant, it'll be the person fiddling with the chopsticks and the various different things and they've touched everything. Yeah? You go, that one's hyperactive. Okay? So if you offer fiddle objects and fiddle things, it actually can help them because it gives them an avenue to get some things <coughs> out. Building breaks with space to move away from others so people can exercise, pace, walk around, use their body. Yeah? Lower demands of listening uh, as, the, as the day goes on. So limit the length of sentences later in the day so that the cognition, the attention be really to the point. So a person might be able to manage full sentences later in the day, give them a three word sentence with the main words that they need to remember, okay? One instruction at a time later in the day, for example, okay? Um, limit attention requirements, particularly when unwell or tired. Remember to praise and reward for effort. It takes a lot of energy to manage the dysregulation. They're working harder than you or I. Okay? So now there's autism. Autism is a very specific cluster of um, neurology, behaviors, relationships. It is still a behavioral diagnosis. So um, what I mean by a behavioral diagnosis is that we look at a person's pattern of communication, how they interact with others, and their social interaction. So if you look at an old 
DSM. There was three criteria, and we used to call it the tripod. What they've done is they've added two of them together to make a two-legged diagnosis. But the first one is communication and social interaction. Okay, so in autism, we have to have some sort of communication difficulty. Even if it's not using their words, it's what we call the social communication. It's how we interact with one another. The understanding of the relationship between you and I, okay? And then the social interaction is how desiring am I to attach to you? Am I alone? and quite okay being alone and self-sufficient, or do I see you as somebody who I want to join with? We're kind of a team, okay? So autism, auto, means turning within. Think of a, a circle, and if the arrows keep going towards the very center of the circle, and that the world revolves around that dot right in the middle of the circle, that's ism, turning within, and auto, towards center. Okay, so autism is essentially a self-centeredness. The world revolves around my needs. The world revolves around me. Okay, so those individuals who have the autism issues with socialization, it's more than just eye contact. Okay, it's about that the world, their needs are more important than anything else. And then there's the behaviors, restricted interest, repetitive behaviors. So that might be that they're interested in one thing or that they have particular behaviors that they stimulate themselves with, okay? So they'll look out of the corner of their eyes, they'll use things that spin, they can stimulate in various different ways, flipping books, jumping, rocking, flapping, lots of things. And it's more than just an expression of hyperarousal. So a lot of our individuals with Fragile X will get excited. Happy, not happy, but when they're hyperaroused, you'll see the behaviors. In autism, those behaviors are about self-stimulation. Okay? Overstimulation, self-stimulation. They're actually two different purposes, even though they might look exactly the same. Okay? So that's why we need the professionals to help us differentiate these two. So 7% of autism is, is caused by Fragile X, but 33% of Fragile X individuals will satisfy the criteria for autism. Okay, so they share common features. Developmental areas, the milestones. So developmental means all those things that we learn to do, yeah? We learn motor skills, we learn social skills, we learn language skills, we learn cognitive problem solving skills, yeah? And from little teensy babies, are they up making cups of coffee? No, they haven't learned it yet, okay? And so all of our life is about a developmental trajectory and there's gonna be peaks and then stabilizations and then more peaks Okay, and social skills and motor skills and language skills and cognitive skills all have a pattern. Okay, a different trajectory for each of them at different ages. Okay, and even though there is developmental delays in our individual, all that means is that their pattern doesn't match the other usual typical pattern. But they might be still learning to do things when they're 14, 15, 20, 24, 30. So individuals with intellectual disability can still be learning much longer in life than what we usually expect, okay? So don't cut, sell them short, all right? They still have a lot of potential, despite some sort of disability, to learn. It's just harder, maybe delayed, okay? So development is across all of those domains and across the lifespan. Neurodevelopmental means that it's neurologically derived. Uh, hyperarousal, so in Fragile X Common, you see the expression of the hyperarousal and behaviors look like stimulation behaviors. That's what we were saying just before. Hand biting in those, again, that's in your notes. Managing behaviors, understand the triggers, understand what's motivating the individual. What are they after? What does the behavior do for them? Okay. 
What are they asking for? And then what is the individual's experiences of those things? If their perception is different, if they can't see depth, they can't actually see stairs very well, okay? So how do you think they're gonna go if you put them in front of stairs? Not good. Not good, okay? It's a bit of an anxiety provoking situation. So if we don't know what their perception is like, we in fact are gonna struggle to manage their <coughs> resistance, okay? So then we can make a plan, we can help that. Understanding how the client is reinforced by the behavior and the responses, so that's that ABC. If you need assistance, we can do a behavioral analysis and be able to understand what's motivating them and what the reactions are. Make a plan to manage the behaviors and if you need to, ask advice. OTs, speeches, psychs, we're all really skilled. Any of those professionals will be able to help you, okay? Thank you. <laughs> I was very close. On time.